to our time of prayer, we typically would, on the third Sunday, talk about national missions, but we did that the first Sunday to connect to the 4th of July. So we pulled that international missions for this week. And so I would remind you, of course, first of all, to be in prayer for the Matha people of Bhutan who have no known efforts to share the gospel in their country um, or among their people. And just to, to think about it, you know, we have a church on every corner and they have, they have none. So that, that's just a, a, we have trouble even fathoming that idea, even even really wrapping our head around it. Um, but it, it's, it's very true uh, that there are places in the world like that. So I would encourage you to pray for the Matva people of Bhutan. And the other group I would ask you to pray for is the uh, Baptist Church of Quantico, Peru. It is a town of several hundred thousand people, and there are three evangelical churches in the whole town. Now, there are a truckload of Catholic churches, and you can find the gospel in the Catholic church if you look hard enough, uh, but a lot of it's buried under ceremony and, and buried under uh, some, some habits that, that try to mask it. Um, but the, the main thing is that there's just not a whole lot of gospel preaching that goes on in that town and in much of much of the nation of Peru, but, but other places have had more success. And I would ask you to pray for um, Gerson Yemis, who is the pastor of that church, and uh, uh, Raul and Yuta, who are his the, the sponsoring church that helped start uh, that church. You know, and where they are in Peru, the, the sponsoring church is less than 100 miles away. It's a 24-hour bus trip to get from one to the other. Why? Because one's on one mountain and one's on the side of the other mountain. And you got to go down and then come up. And you say, is that that hard? Well, you got to remember, when you're talking mountains in Peru, um, you don't even get down to the height of you know, Magazine Mountain or Mount Nebo or Pinnacle. Uh, that we have in Arkansas when you get down until you get to the coast. Uh, there's several thousand feet to cover there, and we just don't even understand that. This is more like going up and down, you know, from Colorado down through New Mexico and then back up. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of travel there, and it's just a challenging uh, environment. So I'd ask you to, to pray for uh, the, the church in Peru uh, specifically. Uh, you know, it, it, and they just call it right now, they just called the Baptist Church of Wanaco, so the Iglesia Bautista de Wanaco. Um, but I ask you to, to pray for them in their, in their work um, and what they do there. And they are in need of outside help. Very small group of folks. They would, they're, they're building, where they meet together would fit in one of these Sunday school rooms. Um, and some weeks they're very full, and other weeks uh, it's very spacious. So I would just encourage you to, to pray for them. So we'll take a few moments and pray uh, for the gospel to go forth into these places, and then I'll listen in the Lord's Prayer, which will be there on the screen. So let's pray.
you join me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So if you would take your Bibles and turn with me to Titus chapter 2. Titus is in your New Testament. It's one of the letters of Paul. And Titus is there towards the back. He's one of the last of the letters of Paul that we have in the New Testament. And matter of fact, he's the next to the last one. Philip is the last one. Um, and it's one of, we call them one of the pastoral letters of Paul. And we're going to look at Titus chapter 2 as we also look at, uh, at we're going through things Baptists believe, and the, the point that we're on today is actually on the idea of education. And coming up, when we get to the end of this, I actually have copies of the Baptist Faith and Message that all of you can take, can stick in your Bible and you can read and go, wow, preacher, you didn't say anything about this part. Uh, but we're going to cover, uh, we're going to cover all of it, but the, the idea of education and the idea of all that we you know, the, the value as Christian people in learning and growing and understanding. And an important thing to realize when you talk about something like a doctrinal statement or a doctrine in general, something that we believe, is that oftentimes you say, okay, but where's the Bible verse for that? And you're like, well, we get that from like part of this Bible verse and part of that Bible verse, and when we put them together, we understand this to be the case. You say, okay, so which Bible verse do you want? It takes, I mean, the list of Bible verses that go with some of these things are as long as the Bible, as the statement that we believe in the first place. But what we see when we look at all of Scripture is the idea that since God created the universe, that anything that is true and worth learning about and worth knowing and worth understanding, anything that is true in some capacity is connected to a better understanding of who God is. This past week, and if I hadn't been at camp, I'd have put together a great big slideshow of it uh, because they're really cool pictures, but of the James Webb Space Telescope that we, the United States put up into orbit, and it's taking pictures of the universe and seeing details and stars in ways that we've never really been able to see before and it's fascinating and it's gorgeous and I could stare at some of that for, for hours because we see what a glorious place our Father has created for us to dwell in and so even things like astrophysics are part of God's truth as we learn we see what God has said. Now, there is an entire rabbit trail here to chase about how we understand when we look at Scripture and it talks about this is when God created and then when we look at some of the things that you know some astrophysicists would say, they say, no, 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 the universe is this old and how do we, what do we do with that? Um, and we can cover that like on a Thursday night sometime over pizza, okay? Because uh, Sunday morning sermons bogged down when I chase science, the science rabbit too much. Um, so we, we won't really chase into that, but realize this, there is nothing that can be found that is true about the universe God created that will ever violate the Word of God that He has given us. Okay, There's nothing that will be found. There was this big fear in the 1800s when a guy dug up this giant bone and went, oh, we don't know what to do with this. And for a few years, people, including preachers, preached about the evil of believing such a thing as dinosaurs even existed because they couldn't accept, they couldn't rationalize that since they weren't really, it didn't seem to be mentioned in the Bible, that, that, that God would have allowed something to have existed and then gone extinct. And it's like, look, guys, there was a flood. There was lots of stuff that made it. Okay? Because... Well, but Noah put two of every kind of animal on the ark. Yeah, but what if they didn't get along? You know, so, you know, what if Mama T-Rex went ahead and ate Daddy T-Rex when they got off the ark and that was it? We're done. 
Okay, so there's you know there's lots of things to, to, to work through there. But all truth is God's truth. That math class that you had to take in school that you go, I still don't understand what that math class was for. First of all, it was because you were learning to, to see what your limitations were. You were learning to be humble. It's a character trait that's worth having by admitting there are things that I don't know. It's a valuable character trait. A huge problem that we have, and this isn't the sermon, because the sermon's going to come from the Bible here in a minute. But a huge problem that we have is that we consistently take away having people do things that they're not good at or having people do things that we can't put a definite value on. Well, I'm not sure why I need algebra. Well, maybe you need algebra so that you realize that you don't know everything. Because our world is getting fuller and fuller of people who are absolutely convinced that they can never possibly make a mistake. And guess what? Every last one of us can make a mistake. Whether it's a big mistake or a small mistake. You know, whether it's it's a big mistake of, of massive, and we just, we hate to admit it. And we hate to have people do something and well, I just don't want you know. We we took our, our youth group or most of our youth group, except for except for the one who couldn't go, uh, to praise works this past week, where they did music and they did some they, they did some other things that they were in, were related to worship and to arts, and some of it involved do the things that you're good at, and other parts of it were go do this and see if you can actually do it. And there were some students who were there, 665 kids between children and youth. Third, third graders through recently graduated or, okay? I guess technically third graders through seniors, if you count Angela as a senior having just graduated, it's kind of, kind of the age bracket. There are some things that they had to do that you weren't gonna get good enough at. In a week, there are certain pieces of music that you just can't master, and that's not the point of the camp anyway. But one of the things that you learned from that was, I can't always succeed. And there's a huge value to that, especially if you're going to lead the church. And, and I don't want Scott to feel thrown under the bus with this because this applies to music leaders and to preachers. And we had to come up with a way to have preacher camp for a week, so I don't know how to, how to make that happen, where we gather all the wannabe preachers, float them out onto the middle of the lake and let them sit there for a day or two. But, um, but one thing that you have to realize is that you can screw this up. Something can always go wrong. And sometimes it's your own fault. You have to learn to deal with that in humility and, and work with that. And we have this, this problem there in, in our world, and I think in our country, where nobody can accept the possibility that they could be wrong. And if you think that's not true, watch, two, watch, a, watch a Republican and a Democrat argue with each other. Because the Republicans are absolutely convinced that they can't possibly be wrong, the Democrats are convinced they can't possibly be wrong. And maybe that just stomped on your political party. I hope it did. Because guess what? There are things that the R's are wrong about. There's things that the D's are wrong about. And you want to know what's going to destroy the liberty that we enjoy as Americans? It's going to be folks that vote for R's even when they do the wrong thing because they're R's and, or who vote for D's but even when they do the wrong thing just because they're D's instead of voting for people who do the right thing. And it gets even worse when some of them find that what they're doing is because they're Christians and really and truly it's not and they're lying to you. And that applies on both sides of the party. But if we don't start looking at finding people with some humility to put into office who are willing to say maybe there's a good idea that can come from somebody else. Y'all, we in it deep. Best thing Abraham Lincoln ever did is he pointed three guys who hated him to his cabinet because they were good at the jobs that needed to be done. One of those guys went around, went off and bought Alaska. So we're glad he bought Alaska. Huh? Okay. Anyway, all right, that's the history lesson. Let's move on. So, and, but when we talk about education, all truth, we talk about that all truth comes from God. And so if it's good and right and true, it helps point us to, to God. We want to learn about that. This is why 
we do things like encourage education in general. We want you to go learn. You know, we want our students to take classes in biology and in chemistry and in math and in literature and in history and, and in all these other things because that truth comes from God. He made the universe with it. So you know, there's actually math behind uh, behind music. There's math that connects to music. It's worth learning. But where do we learn it from? Well, let's take a look at something. Titus chapter 2. Paul writes to Titus and says, You are to proclaim things consistent with sound teaching. Older men are to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible, and sound in faith, love, and endurance. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not slaves to excessive drinking. They are to teach what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, workers at home, kind, and in submission to their husbands, so that God's word will not be slandered. In the same way, encourage young men to be self-controlled in everything. Make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. Your message is to be sound beyond reproach, so that any opponent will be ashamed because he doesn't have anything bad to say about us. Now, there's a sermon here about older men's responsibility in the church and older men's character in the church. There's a sermon about older women's responsibility and character. There's a sermon about young men's responsibility and character and a sermon about young women's responsibility and character. And we're not going to preach those sermons today because it's hot up here and I don't think I can preach five sermons without taking a break. The fifth sermon is the one that we're going to preach, that we're going to look at. And that's this. Overall, the idea that Paul is giving Titus about the importance of training and teaching the ongoing generations of the church. And to that end, I brought a couple of friends I want to introduce to you. Um, and these friends are here. They are books. You say, it says how older men are supposed to teach younger men. Well, this book, for example, uh, is translated and edited by Judith Kovacs, but it's called The Church's Bible. And it's a First Corinthians Bible commentary. And what it, this has is this has reflections on Scripture written in the 3rd, 4th, and 5th century. Translated into English, just in case your Latin is as bad as mine. Okay? It's hard to get much older than 1,700 years of teaching about what God had to say. You see, sometimes we disdain book learning. Well, I don't, I don't need books. I just, I'm just going to read the Bible and go on. But Scripture tells us when we read the Bible that we should learn from those who have gone before us. And while there is an immense value, and we'll get to this in a second, the immense value of learning from people that you can share the same room with and listen to them breathe, while they teach that you can look at, there's also an immense value in digging up people who've been there and who've done it for a long, long time and whose wisdom holds on for ages. And so that's this one, uh, which is great. Uh, this is another one of my, my friends. Uh, this is Helmut Theokin, who is a, a German theologian who's recently passed. Uh, but he writes and, and summarizes some of the teachings of Charles Spurgeon, who's a 19th century Baptist in England who preached the gospel and, and held his church true. And you can tell, if you can see them, see all the little flaggies in there? All the little tabs sticking out of that? I put those there uh, the second time I read this book. Uh, but this is one I read every couple of years just as a reminder of what we can learn from that and what we can learn from somebody who, who preached. Uh, this is another one. This isn't at all theological, uh, but this is by a guy named Jeff Manoff, and he interviewed people who uh, committed crime on an ongoing basis and wrote this book entitled A Burglar's Guide to the City, and it's about how to see the risks and dangers in the world around you and also how to adjust for them. Why? Because... If you want to learn, learn from people who know what they're talking about. Also, sometimes it's just good to have something that you read and you go, wow, I'm glad I don't live in New York. Anyway. <laughs> um, and then two more, and this is this is one. Uh, the Valdenses were a, a group of 
church reformers from about the 12th century to about the 16th century. And they're just absolutely fascinating. They are one of my officially doc uh, documented research interests, but it's a book about them and how they strove to preach the gospel at a gospel of faith in Christ, even though they were surrounded by people who said, no, all you need to do is go to church and let the priest tell you that you're saved. And what did they do about that? They had this, this crazy idea the Valdenses did. Um, their leader was a guy named Peter Waldo. He was known for wearing jeans and a red and white striped sweater. <laughs> Some of you get that because you've seen a Where's Waldo book, which is a picture book where they hide the one and keep kids busy for hours. Um, but uh, had this crazy idea that people should read the Bible in their own language rather than have the priest read it in Latin and then tell them what it means. Um, and it was considered crazy at the time. As a result, the Valdenses were tended to be persecuted and run out of town and threatened with violence. Um, all for this, like I said, this, this strange idea that people should read their own Bible. And in this, this is one of a set, and I have the whole set. This is uh, 20 centuries of great preaching, which some people say, well, yeah, by the time you get to a sermon, it feels like it's been 20 centuries, but at least it's great preaching. Uh, but this is actually the, the first volume that covers a lot of historical preachers. This is where I first met a guy by the name of John Chrysostom, who was a preacher in the 4th century AD. And just absolutely fascinating. You learn about his life. He's got examples of his preaching in there. Uh, he preached shorter than I do, but he also preached in Greek. So when I start preaching in Greek, I will preach shorter. Uh, but he, uh, you know, but we learn from these people, and there's a value in it because folks have followed Jesus for two thousand years, and to think that the only thing that we need is what we can come up with right now very deeply misses a point, and it misses the idea of learning from the older men and the older women. Because they're a part of that great cloud of witnesses that are referenced in, in, in Hebrews. Now there's also another form of learning, because it's not just books, there's also practical. See, I've never read a book about how to use, I'm going to start carrying a screwdriver just in case I find a screw loose in the church, but um, about how to use a screwdriver. Now I think there are books about how to use a screwdriver, but I've never read one. However, I do generally know how to use a screwdriver and a hammer and a wrench. You know, I've learned how to replace a, a sink. I've learned how to do some various car work, usually from somebody who's done it before. And I've watched and listened and asked questions. And watched and listened and asked questions and then done it. And gotten it wrong and had to fix it and then ask more questions and then learn. So some of our learning is very practical and hands-on. Some of it is very much is, is book-driven. Some of it's driven by talking to people and hearing from them. Some of it is we get from, from reading, from watching, from hearing. But all of it has value as it points us to who God is and what God would have us to do. I made a statement earlier in the service about you know, if you want to borrow the, the plague book to read about the history of, of plagues and, and, and public health responses to pandemics. You, know, you can, but it's not a very cheerful read. And the reason it's not a cheerful read is that it, in no way does it connect anybody to the, and this is where you find hope in the midst of that. You find it in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, it also doesn't even take note of the fact that across many plagues in history, the folks who were willing to care for the sick and the dying were the church because the church trusted that if they got sick and died they would see Jesus and it was okay and they saw that as valuable that that was what the church should do many of our traditions of, of hospitals and medical care in our world now are anchored in the behaviors of the church for 1700 years Okay, a hospital is not something that was invented by your medical insurance company. A 
And hospitals are not something that governments did originally. Hospitals are things that believing believers in Jesus did. Same thing's also true of schools. And education methods. It started with the church believing it was important to teach folks not just facts, facts are valuable, but to teach these other things that are mentioned, what it is to be self-controlled, to be sensible, to have faith, to not be slanderers, but to be reverent. All of these aspects of character, because the second thing about education, not only is it that we learn from those who have gone before us, whether we, we share the space with them or, or read what they left behind, but it's also not just about facts, but it's about character and formation. You see, this is one of my challenges. We spent life this past week, like I said, at, at PraiseWorks doing uh, a lot of different things with worship and, and with art. But this is one of my challenges when it comes to uh, music. Now, I can take, I could sit over there at the piano and I can look at the music and I can take the note and I can go, that means I push this button. Or, excuse me, I press this key. Okay. I know how the piano works. I can tell you mathematically that this, that the strings for this one are twice as long as the strings for this one. I know all of these facts about it. But I don't play piano well. In fact, I gave it up years ago and, and quit even really trying that hard because I can play it very mechanically, very factually, without much feeling, without much formation to the music. See, that's the thing that sets apart our instrumentalists from people like me. Is that when they play, there's feeling. Because they're formed by that music. Because I could play, I, I could potentially play one of the exact same songs that, that, you know, I could sit there and play the solid rock and you would just go, okay, but, but you let Miss Ann play solid rock and you it's hard to not sing along and get into it. I can strum a chord or two on the guitar, but you know, let Stephen get healthy and get him back to playing, and it's hard to not you know get going. They they play in the he played in the talent show this past week, and he didn't get three bars in, and people are clapping and cheering along with him, um, you know, because not only does he have the facts, but he's got the formation and the feelings as he plays. And the same is true of the knowledge that we learn. This is important about our knowledge about God. I can give you big theology words through three of them a preacher this week because it was fun. Omniscient. God is omniscient. What does that mean? He knows everything. There's nothing that God does not know. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. There's nothing that God cannot do. He's omnipresent. There's no place that God is not. Well, those are great facts, and you can memorize those. In fact, you should. There'll be a test in next week. What does it mean to be formed by that? Not only to know that God knows everything, but what do we do about it? How does that affect our character? Not only to be able to look, for example, at the word sensible. We're to be sensible. What does that mean? What does it mean when we look at the idea that we should be self-controlled? What does it mean to be an example of good works with integrity and dignity? Well, I can define those words for you. But if they don't shape our lives, they don't mean anything. Jesus tells us that if we're going to spread the gospel, that the world will know we're his disciples by our love for one another. What does that actually look like? It's one thing to quote it. It's another thing to, to be able to give you a definition of it. But what does it actually look like? You see, it's not enough just to learn. Learning is good. Learning is valuable. And, and part of the process of learning is having the humility to realize that you don't know them. There are some people, there are some preachers, and some people look at preachers and say, you got all those books, you must think you're really smart. Actually, I have all those books because I think I'm not very smart at all. Because Spurgeon is smarter than I am. 
because Michael Bird is smarter than I am, because Amy Bird is smarter than I am. She wrote, she's, they're not related. Um, but, you know, because all these people are, because Danny Hayes is smarter about the Old Testament than I, than I am. Because if you want to take apart the Greek of a sentence, you really want Bruce Metzger's understanding of it, not mine. Why do I have all these books? Not because I know so much, because I recognize I know so little. Learning is about humility. But then as we bring those facts forward, then they're supposed to be those facts should lead us to formation, where it begins to shape us. Now that I know that there is no place that God is not, if God is omnipresent, if he's everywhere, what does that shape in my character? Number one, it should shape me to not feel abandoned, to recognize that I'm not abandoned. When I start to feel that way, to be able to go back to the fact, but I know this to be true, God is never absent. So it may be dark and it may be foreboding and it may be a terrible day, but God has not abandoned me through it because God never abandons anyone, anywhere. He's always present. And that ought to, even if it can't cheer me up, it ought to help me hold on. Number two, recognizing that God is everywhere. Then when I start to think about the, about people like our people group, the Matlo Bhutan, who never heard the gospel explained to them in a way, in their language and in, and in their homes where they understand it and hear it, Realize that it's not the absence of God that keeps them from knowing the gospel. It's the absence of God's people who have kept them from hearing the gospel. Which means that he's expecting us to go there. It's not that we need to pray, Lord, please show up somehow. Please go to those people. It's, Lord, how do we go where we already are to do what you've already told us to do? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We talked about that one last week, didn't we? If God is everywhere, then when I pray, I don't have to inform God about things that I'm afraid he doesn't know. If God is everywhere, then it shapes the way I pray for what the United States government does or the way I pray for what goes on in school. Because all this nonsense about they kicked God out of school is a lie. If your God could be kicked out of school, he's not the biblical God anyway. God is as present there as he ever has been. The question is whether or not we will acknowledge him. You never have to pray that God would be someplace. You have to pray that people will acknowledge his presence. And there's a difference that forms us. There's a difference in which we're formed by the fact that we accept it as a basic truth that in the image of God, he created humanity. He created male and female. He created people. And every person you've ever met is made in the image of God and is therefore valuable. Including your boss at work. You may not like that, but it's true. Including President of the United States. You may not like him, but it's true. You may want to critique his policies, and you should, because a lot of them are bad. But don't degrade his humanity. He's made an image of God just like you are. You ought to be formed by believing that fact to be true. You ought to be formed by believing the fact that Jesus died for everybody, which is a fact in Scripture. He died that all people could know God. You ought to be formed by that. And so when somebody says, hey, let's have, let's, let's, let's run, let, let's try to pick people up and bring them to church from over in that neighborhood. And you say, ooh, wait a minute. We don't want them at our church. Them was made in the image of, Je in the image of God, just like you are. God never have it them. Because we ought to be formed by the things that we know to be.
You see, education is not just about facts, although they're a part of it. In the same way, the building is not just about walls. It's also about windows, roof, air conditioning ducts, air conditioning units, fans, more air conditioners. Education is also about what, how we're formed and how we're shaped. This is why there is such value in the people who teach. Such value in a Sunday school teacher. Because a Sunday school class becomes like its teacher as they follow Jesus. Are you a cheerful Sunday school teacher? Are you prepared? Are you committed? Are you willing for your class to grow and to have strangers in your class? Then the rest of your class will pick up on that and they'll want that and they'll be that way too. Are you a grouchy Sunday school teacher? Are you inconsistent? Would you be just as happy if you never had to add one more person to your Sunday school role? The rest of your class is going to look around and say, you know what, we don't want to share the gospel with you. When we send kids to school, this is why it matters that we should encourage people to pursue the vocation of teaching. To begin to learn and be formed by the character of their teachers. The character of their school counselors. Why it is valuable that we should encourage people who work in our school systems and pray for them and support them. Why? Because if we as the church will encourage them, then they will help form people as they learn to follow Jesus. But we've got this fear thing happening where folks want to back away from that and say, oh no, last thing I'd want anybody to have to do is, is teach, in a, teach in a school. But where else are they going to teach? It gets too hot in the park sometimes. Instead, we ought to encourage. Why? Because they shape and they form. As they present facts, as they present information, they also shape and form character. One of the biggest influences when I was in high school years ago, um, well, the physics teacher, because as fire was discovered while we were in school, he helped us learn about that. But the other thing was, it was a joke about how long it was been, but was our, our math teacher, sophomore, junior year, algebra two and trigonometry. Who are you? Those were the days. But she was a passionate follower of Jesus as well. She taught us math, but the way that she helped people learn, learn about how to deal with mistakes, how to deal with life, and her character spoke volumes. Did she ever stop class and preach? She did not. Did she ever have a stack of invitations to the church youth activities on her desk? Did she let the members of her youth, of the church's youth group who were in her classes, know were there so that they knew to point other students, hey, grab one of those off Ms. Kaplan's desk? So that she was fully obeying the laws and rules that were around her. Did kids show up and hear about Jesus because they trusted Ms. Kaplan to be truthful? Because of the way she taught now. They did. Did some of our students who didn't, you know, who you know, didn't have any other Christian witness in their life, did they come to Christ and they'll be in heaven instead of in hell because of how she taught math? Yes. Things we know ought to form us, and the education that we can give to others is valuable. And finally, within the church, 
it is very, very true that times change, things change. And we don't always like that. We long for the days that we can go back and just do this the way we've always done it. But sometimes what we have to do is to take what we long to see happen and make sure that we teach and pass on to others how we do things in the church. And maybe they're going to change it a little bit. Math has changed over the years. When I was in school, graphing calculators were this fun little add-on that we used to play games when we were supposed to do our homework. <laughs> Nowadays, it's like, you've got to have one of these if you're going to do it. I learned how to do calculus by hand. Now it's like, oh yeah, you just punch it in there and punch the derivative button. That eh, doesn't even sound right. But we used to have to tune our musical instruments by ear instead of having an electronic tuner in front of us too. And some of us that it would have been better off with an electronic tuner. We have to allow for that change, but we have to pass it on. One of our major problems in church as we look around is that we've got to look for those folks who are coming behind us to carry on what we do. Talked to a pastor this past week and his statement was that 75% of the work in his church is done by people aged 70 and over. He said, I'm five years from the place falling out. The giving, the work, everything. He said, we're trying to get things going. He said, but we've got to get that generation to teach the next generation basic things and then to also entrust them with it. And that's really one of our big challenges. There's a good many churches that the average age of the people who do a lot of the ongoing work in the church, the folks who know how the finance system works, the folks who do the Sunday school teaching, the folks who do all of this Folks who know where the water valve shutoff is so that when the pipes spring a leak, somebody can turn it off. We have to pass on that knowledge, that understanding, and entrust folks to do stuff. Many times we stumble and fall because we look around and go, well, the preacher's not here. Who's going to take his place? One of my big failings is that I, I got nobody. I am for the one somebody I've got at home with a sinus infection. But uh, the you know, there are directions that we have to that we have to go forward with. How do we do this? What do we do next? And it's all part of this value that we have to have that is that we are not as a church and as God's people going to live as if we think that we're the last folks that'll have to that'll have to do it. And by the way, this will tie over into next week's sermon about stewardship. I'll give you a preview of that because I know some of y'all are going to be gone next week. Stewardship's not about money. Stewardship's about this fancy word that you hear a lot these days called sustainability. Stewardship is not just about money. Stewardship is about using what God's given us to make sure that what God's commanded us to do keeps on happening. And it connects to education. It connects to learning. It connects to passing on what we know because education is about helping people steward God's gifts that he's given them so that there's somebody that comes next with that knowledge. And it's both, both knowledge and practical knowledge. Every one of y'all that cooks knows that there's an importance of both. Because Grandma can, you know, has probably you know, probably wrote down how to make biscuits for you eventually. She wrote you the, 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 the recipe. This much flour, this many eggs, this much milk. But until you watched her and saw how she mixed them together, Anne has this great recipe for pizza. To make a, a pretzel crust pizza. And it's something that we like and everybody else might think is weird, but we really like it. 
but there are steps there that aren't written on the recipe that are just, oh yeah, I do this and then I do that. There's techniques that you've learned from sitting in the kitchen watching her that you'd never get from the written page. In the same way we could write down, well, this is how you do this in church. But we've got to get involved and see how it's done so that we can pass it forward. So that we know what it is. And oftentimes we don't do that. We need to. Because we have to realize that we don't exist just for ourselves and just for right now. We exist to make sure that the message of the gospel continues to be proclaimed, not just this year and next year, but unto the years to come. Why? Because otherwise, we miss this truth. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lust, living in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age, waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The grace of God has appeared. Let's make sure that we always make certain that message is proclaimed. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to follow you up. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.